Leah Elson is a clinical development scientist, author, and science communicator with a wide range of research interests in the medical fields. Join us as we speak about how Leah is here to help through clinical development and research, her web series, 60 Seconds of Science, where she dispenses accessible answers to scientific questions, and her new book, There Are No Stupid Questions in Science. I'm Michelle Ong, and this is Steam Powered. Good evening, Leah. Thank you so much for joining me today on Steam Powered. I'm really looking forward to having this amazing conversation with you about your very cool journey. I am delighted. Thank you so much for having me. It's amazing. Yeah, so you know, you've done a heap of things and we'll be totally getting into that soon. But you've also written a book called There Are No Stupid Questions in Science, which is coming out in June next year in yeah, 2023. And we'll also be coming back to that in a bit. Very exciting. <laughs> So getting into your journey straight off, you actually started in sports casting. But you know, how does one get into sports casting? It's sort of a strange deviation, right, from scientist to sportscaster. I, you know, I, I always had a love for the sciences since I was a young child. And I think when you go through your college journey, most of us ha really have no idea what we want to do, right? <laughs> Not, yep. Nobody knows what they want to do. And I think sports casting was a natural fit for me. I was an athlete and I was also kind of a ham in front of the camera. <laughs> and so it was an easy segue and I kind of naturally fell into it. And I began doing some sports publishing and sports casting for the arena football team in San Diego, which is where I'm from. Um, but my dad had a battery of health problems. And one night when we were going live and I was on the side of the field, I remember distinctly as the producer was counting me down for a live feed, thinking to myself, what am I doing with my life? Is this impactful? Is this helping the human condition? And so I, I quit shortly thereafter and did a bunch of soul searching and found my way, thankfully, back into the sciences, which is where my, my heart lies. So it's all, it's all been history since then. Yeah, absolutely. So... You, when you actually started back into science and academia, that was through pre-med, right? Yeah, that was when I had started long, long ago. I began as a research assistant for a joint doctoral program. So I was helping mm -hmm. someone with their thesis at the time. And I had to do a lot of interface in the community. We were talking about sexually transmitted disease and binge drinking and how human behavior also affects human health. And so that was my, my very first soiree with research. And that was in, oh boy, 2007, 2008, a while back. <laughs> yeah. So with pre-med, where did you see yourself originally heading down that route? Were you actually thinking about becoming a doctor or you know, was there a specialist field that you were thinking of exploring? Sure. So I was. I really, really liked surgery. I have grown up with my dad rebuilding cars and pouring cement slabs and very hands-on. He treated me sort of like a son. And so I learned to do carpentry and, and that made sense to me, actually physically correcting something. I wanted to see a problem and be able to correct it with that kind of visual satisfaction and that feedback that it had been it had been done, it had been corrected. And, um, you know, I, I did end up going to medical school for a year and sort of took a step back with some more health problems from my father and sort of realized, uh, and I think a lot of physicians are in the same space where you get into it and you realize that you no longer can affect as many patients as you may have thought that you had going in, right? There's sort mm -hmm. of this idealized version of becoming a practicing physician where you're like, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to affect all these patients. And in the United States, especially, there are a lot of barriers to effecting true change. There's a lot of red tape. And uh, I loved research. You know, I was non-traditional going in and I thought, you know, I can still stay upstream medicine and I can possibly develop something that can affect millions of patients rather than seeing maybe 10, 12 patients a day and kind of still doing the rote things. Um, so I, I stuck with upstream, went back into, into research side of things, but stayed with medicine. That's very cool. Yeah, because it, it's kind of the difference between whether you know, you're affecting people on an immediate kind of capacity and you get to see each patient as you go through and, you know, see that you're making a difference there. 
Whereas research, like, it's still a long game because you have no idea how long it's going to take for whatever it is that you're developing or creating to have an impact out in the wider world. And so much of it is a, is a moving target too, you know, it's yes. it, because I, and, and this is, I'm in biotech now and I've, I've been involved in research from both the academia side as well as in biotech. And yeah. so much of innovation I see all, in general is for the sake of innovation. And oftentimes mm-hmm. I think we don't take a step back and say, what is the efficacy of this? <laughs> and it's innovative yeah. and it's great and it's cool and it, you can slap an awesome sticker on it. But is it truly making an efficacious difference in quantum leaps? Um, some things yes, some things no, I think. But a moving target, yeah. certainly. But yeah. So, you know, getting into your research kind of space, what? does a clinical development scientist do? <laughs> That's an excellent question. <laughs> I think so much of it is <laughs> what don't I do on a daily basis, right? Um, so in in my capacity, I'm sort of, I straddle the world between, I would say, pure R&D and, mm-hmm. you know, bench top work and behind the curtain kind of work and the application of existing technology. So something that I'm charged with is sort of helping to steer the ship in where is our technology best applied to affect the largest number of patients? Or are there marginalized patient groups that are not getting the help that they need that we could potentially help devise algorithms to go in and and assist them? Um, So specifically, I work in the field of peripheral nerve repair. So reestablishing sensation and motor function to extremities, um, you know, sensation in in patients that have had mastectomies, right? That's a, a very large problem is yeah. women end up losing, they become insensate in the chest. And mm. that is psychologically uh, really damaging for the women because uh, like hugging a loved one, yeah. you know, if you can't feel that hug, that becomes very psychologically detrimental, but also just for protective sensation. You know, mm. we've had unfortunate patients that have come in with burns because they just didn't know that they were burning post mastectomy. And so they, they came in with, with these horrible burns from cigarettes or, you know, hair curlers or something. Um, so, you know, we find these patients now, you know, one of the interesting things I'm looking at is gender affirmation, right? And yeah. this is sort of where medicine is meeting the contemporary culture and uh, moving forward in the direction of understanding more about gender identity and helping mm. these patients to really sort of solidify their gender identities. So how do we help in that space in peripheral nerve repair, right? Because for something like gender reassignment surgery, there's a lot of nerve endings that need to be reconnected yeah. during those procedures. So that's sort of my task is knowing what's in our portfolio of things that we can do and employ to help ensure appropriate nerve repair. And then what are interesting procedures that are on the horizon that I can kind of help to champion with surgeons. So that that is absolutely an amazing field of research because it's yeah, it, it's so important. And when you know women or anyone who has to go through this kind of surgery, it's yeah, there's already so much psychological stuff happening up leading all the way up into it, whether it's because you need gender af- affirmation or whether it's because of cancer. It's yeah, there's so much involved in that. And it's such a very compassionate and humane kind of field to be looking into. And yeah, it's like yeah, it's taking a step away again from the purely clinical, you know, let's just cut it off and we're good. Exactly. <laughs> that, that, yeah. And then you're good to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're good. Off you go. You're fine. <laughs> I think yeah. one of the the beauties of, you know, having this l- large swath of longitudinal data, having been in academia and biotech, and, and I've been in very conservative aspects like ivy towers of academia, and sort of seeing the paradigm shift of how mm. patients are approached. Um, they're approached, I think, more holistically now, and people are beginning to track down how satisfied is the patient with the treatment that I gave them? How psychologically are they? Are Do they have a good quality of life based upon what we've done? And I think yeah. that's something that has garnered far more support these days in our community as practitioners and researchers than has been seen in the past, right? Because like you said, it used to, yeah. it used to be, ah, well, you had surgery. Of course, you're not going to feel anything there. Or ah, of course, you're going to be in pain. You know, <laughs> sorry, your quality of life is not good now. Um, <laughs> So now I think there's this large priority shift where we are now saying not only can we do it, but should we? And how is this going to affect them psychologically and their well-being in totality for the rest of their life? It's a good thing to see. It is such a good thing to see. And it's, I think, it's not just 
good for the patients, but it's also good for the culture of the medical field because we're still stuck with this, you know, house MD stereotype of yes. extremely clinical, extremely rough and brusque. And, you know, there's so many movements everywhere about compassion in med and, you know, internally as well as externally. And, you know, getting people to think about things like this in a different way, being able to think about your interactions, you know, relationships before, during and after you have that relationship with that patient is, you know, it's such an, an important paradigm shift for care. It's critical. It's critical. And I think something that uh, the biotech company that I work for does well is bringing patients back to meet the research stuff to say yeah. this is where your productivity goes, you know, because you get so, you, you know how it is, you yeah. get so myopic in a project and you're like, <laughs> I'm here in these rodent models and my experiment works. <laughs> Beautiful. But there is an end game, right? There is something yeah. you're trying to achieve and being able to meet patients or hear the stories of where they're coming from and how you've affected their lives. It, mm. I mean, it's it's amazing. It's moving and gripping and you're like, I'm, I'm making a difference. You know, I might be yeah. in here and exhausted and looking at this one model that I can't get to work. Um, but, you know, it's it's seeing that end game, I think. It just contextualizes Absolutely. everything, makes it so important. Yeah. And you get so much feedback, not just for the work that you've done, but for all the work that you have to come. Because every interaction, every bit of feedback, every bit of understanding of the impact that you have and how that impact you know, literally affects aspects of these people's lives gives you a better understanding of how to do better next time as well. Of course. And I've always been such a proponent of science being the grand sort of social cultural equalizer, right? Because you have teams of people with different religions, creeds, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds, family types, you know, everything about us is different, but we come together as sort of this motley group and we yeah. work towards a common goal. And I think that there's something so beautiful about the field of STEM that in many cases, you know, you're you're helping people that you may not see that or that may be completely different on the sociopolitical spectrum from you. But it's all for that common goal of just helping humanity and helping to yeah. sort of bridge these disparities in humanity, right? And um, so I've always grandstanded about that. I'm like, science is more philosophic than I think a lot yes. of people realize. Absolutely. And yeah, I think so many, yeah, we, we just lost sight of that. Because, yeah, it, it really is about who we are, what we want to be, and who we want to become. And, yeah, it, it's, there's so much scope here for growth in all areas. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. So you know, looking also at your extreme range of things that you have published in research, I, I know that med and biotech are very broad as fields. Like, there's so much scope there as it is. But how do you determine what you're going to work on next? Like, is it driven by industry factors or does your work just happen to build on each other and you're able to find these connecting points to move on to the next project? Sure. So I think it's it depends the the type of environment that you work in. In academia, you have a little bit more running room. If you have a great idea, you can pursue it very ravenously, right? They encourage that. In yep. some institutions, of course. Others, maybe not so much. Um, in biotech, you're a little bit more, I would say, focused in scope because you are employed to work on a very specific area. So, you know, um, for instance, work that I'm doing currently that I'll be working on tomorrow morning is focused on one particular part of our portfolio of technology and then another subcomponent of that, right? It's sort of yeah. a specialty within a specialty. And so my research is sort of focused in in that capacity. Um, but, you know, so much in, in what I tell people who are sort of in a generation after me, when they're looking to publish or they're looking to sort of expand their wings as a researcher, as a scientist, I always tell them, you know, be – brazen, be vocal, be uh, boundary pushing, because so much of science, I think we get entrenched in sort of the next step in the next project. 
But really where you will end up shining is out of the box thinking. And so that's where a myriad of my publications have come from is that I had an idea and I said, I know we've got epidemiologic information. I know we have our hands on this. Let's look at it. Let's just run statistics and see if there's anything of merit here that can be of use for the field. Um, and so many of my publications have come from that venture as me just saying, well, what if or let's see <laughs> if this worked? You know, we have 10 years of data. Why don't we dive into it and see what we can come up with? That's amazing. So, yeah, it, it's it's just such an amazing rabbit hole of things that you can just explore because you can. and You yeah. can. That's the beauty of science, yeah. right? <laughs> it is. It's the beauty of science. And you can chase it as deep as you want or, you know, you can find, some, you know, some little segue to this other thing that you had no idea existed before. And, you know, the best kind of discoveries have been accidental. <laughs> Oh, oh my gosh. What, some of the best discoveries in all of science have been accidental, right? I, yeah. LSD was an accidental discovery, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I think he spilled something on his hand and then tried to ride his bike home and it didn't work out well for him. <laughs> accidental hallucinogen discovery. <laughs> yeah, probably not the best kind of way to discover it, though. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's cool. So you're working in industry doing this kind of research, but you're also doing your own studies. And is that working towards your PhD? I mean, so the the other ancillary studies are towards that PhD. And because I had to pivot, I, my terminal degree would have been a doctoral degree <laughs> for medicine. And now I'm pivoting yeah. back into research. Um, so most of it has been vocational. Um, but I do maintain close contact with a lot of my mentors from from previous fields. And so sometimes I'll think of something and say, hey, uh, if you still have that data, because another thing I try to tell people that come after me who are like, I really just want to break into research. How do you do it? I tell them, take a stats course, because if you're a statistician in the sciences, <laughs> you are so invaluable. <laughs> if you can yes. interpret p-values, you will be a, a gold ticket for most PIs. <laughs> um, so a, a lot of it is just continued collaboration through the years. You know, people will often reach out to me that have worked with me in the past and say, hey, okay. we have this really cool idea. What do you think of this? Let me bounce this off of you. And so I think maintaining connections has been also very fortuitous for me insofar as, you know, continuing that strange rabbit hole of all of these different things that I've gone down in, in research. That is very cool. And yeah, absolutely. Like keeping all these networks really active and it's hard work, but you really do need to do it. Like it, it's a thing that a lot of people take for granted because you never know when a connection is you know, going to come in handy or, you know, you can start introducing other connections. It, it's such a valuable part of the way that we work these days, especially when we start crossing different fields. Of course. And it's strange because, you know, as we talked about earlier, the, the, field of upstream medical research is so vast. I mean, I don't yes. even know that you can quantify how large it is. <laughs> but surprisingly, it is a very intimate community. Um, yeah. You know, right now I'm in the field of peripheral nerve repair, but I have a background in oncology as well. And now sort of marrying that and talking about patients with mastectomies and things, you know, it's like mm -hmm. you you end up converging strangely, I think, on yeah. things you had done in the past, right? Because you you begin to build these skill sets and that makes you an asset for certain things, you know, and you become mm -hmm. an advisor on very specific things that you may not have even conceptualized would have crossed your path again, but it always does. Yeah, it really does because, you know, so much of the stuff that we're starting to understand now is so completely interrelated. I mean, incredibly. To bring up, yeah, and I mean, to bring up COVID, like you see that there's so many different symptoms and impacts and you know long COVID and the way that it affects everyone so differently we're starting to get this understanding that so many different aspects of our physiology which we treat completely differently have mm -hmm. connecting points that we haven't figured out yet and yeah it, it's so important to keep those connections because you don't know where all of these overlaps are going to be. Of course and what a salient moment COVID was because I think medicine especially there's so many hyper focuses right you go to mm. residency and then you go to several fellowships and you become so specialized in your medical field but covid was really sort of the globalizing factor that brought everyone together and it's crazy that you mentioned this because i was just speaking to a surgeon the other day and we were talking about 
how COVID by nature of being so Mm pro-inflammatory, we're now seeing that patients with peripheral nerve damage, if they've had COVID somewhat recently, their nerves are very slow to regenerate when you're trying to encourage these repairs. And we think that there's probably something implicit in just the lingering COVID that we still have yet to uncover or explore. But yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's so strange. I mean, you you would have thought when this <laughs> pandemic happened that we would be done with this discussion, but I'm <laughs> blown away. Every journal that you pick up, there's something about COVID. Somebody has found something new about COVID or a particular subgroup of patients with COVID. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. And <laughs> it must be so infuriating as well. It's like, right, my research is going really amazing. And this COVID has completely thrown me off course. Exactly. What do we do now? <laughs> <laughs> Whether from a personnel standpoint or just, you know, patient participation or, yeah, in, incredible, absolutely incredible. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, and like the number of patients who end up having to be excluded because like, well, we don't know what's going on here. We can't work with this material at all. <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't neglect that they might be a confounder just by virtue of having COVID because there's so yeah. many unknowns still. It's so strange. It is, Yeah fascinating for decades to come and uh, yes. <laughs> yes not always decades. in the best way <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah so where to with your research next because having gone through you know so many different spaces with oncology and you know done nerve repair and you've done so many other things as well before where is the goal for research for you that's a really good question. Because uh, again, um, it's a moving target, right? We yeah. we tend to, we capitalize on what everyone else is doing in the field. And so you pivot into positions that you may not have f- foreseen for yourself. Yeah. Um, something that's interesting to me is this recent discovery that peripheral nerves are exceptionally picky about how mm-hmm. they will regenerate. And we have seen in preclinical modeling that If you were to have a damaged tissue bed, uh, let's say you have a a car accident or some kind of crush injury and the tissue is damaged, but the nerve is completely spared. The surgeon sees it. He said, that nerve is pristine. This patient got so lucky and I'm going to go ahead and close up and we're going to be good to go. What we've noted is that by virtue of being in a damaged tissue bed, the nerve will degenerate for no reason. It will be totally healthy. But because it's in this microenvironment that might be somewhat hostile, uh, it will break down and it will act as though it has received a direct injury. And we have no idea why. This is stuff that most people still don't even know. But things that I luckily being sort of in my field I've seen now and have have, uh, noted quite early on. And um, so I think understanding a bit more about, you know, transcriptomes and what is happening like genetically, that is the the biggest, most important thing we will ever understand is genetically, how are all of these genes affecting human disease, human repair processes? Yeah. And everyone says like, what's what's the, you know, what's the the next greatest thing in science? And I'm, I tell them, you know, it's not a pharmaceutical. It is not mm-hmm. a procedure. It is, it is completely unpacking the human genome and, and really capitalizing on gene editing, right? I mean, we just doled out a Nobel Prize for gene editing, right, for CRISPR-Cas9. Yeah. Um, But we are so uh, infantile in our understanding of the implications (laughs) of what this does. And so I'm like, you know, it's really great and wonderful. And obviously, you know, being able to switch out single base pairs, amazing. But we (laughs) don't know what happens downstream. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, I think I'm I'm always interested in what's happening genetically, what's driving all of these weird macroscopic changes that we're seeing. And so I see, even though it hasn't traditionally been a part of my day-to-day research, I see myself being driven more into that corral mm-hmm. because that's where medicine needs to be going, I think, yeah, for real curative effects or to at least understand where the base of all of this comes from. What's the foundation of this weird thing that I'm seeing with this tissue? Um, so I think that's probably where I will end up, likely. Yeah, it, it feels like it's where everyone's going to be ending up at this point because, yeah, the field is such it, – it's so young when you think about it in terms of sciences. And, you know, so we're young. doing, you know, yeah, two-dimensional DNA strands. And it's like, that's awesome. We can see this. But now it's like, oh, we need to do three-dimensional because having these individual pairs, having these understandings of these individual genes has no value without context. 
Exactly. And yeah, so we're saying, you know, we can detect if you happen to have these particular genes that suggest you might have a predisposition for cancer. But you might not get it, but we just happen to think you have that possibility. And now a little like, extra well, spice. Yeah, little yeah, spicy DNA. That's what we want. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, now they're doing like 3D. They're going to say, well, th- DNA's packed into a little ball. There's three dimensions. There's context. There's locational stuff. It's all very important to understand how each of the genes relate to each other. It's like, right, okay, so now this is a problem because we have no idea how any of this works. It's all very, very small. And, you know, what kind of difference does one position make? <laughs> Exactly. It, and the, the the quaternary structures and tertiary, I mean, this is something that we, di- we didn't even conceptualize, I think, a few years ago, yeah. you know, and it's, you know that it's going to be impactful, I think, when it has divided the room so extensively. <laughs> you know, you see these, throughout the course of history, these grand claims, you know, um, Einstein conceptualizing and helping to be a part of the team conceptualizing quantum mechanics and Mm. quantum entanglement, right? He was one of the first people that said that. And it even divided him and himself. He hated it, you know? And (laughs) I feel like the more you see scientists diverge and start to bicker, you're like, oh, this is going to be something big and impactful. (laughs) Absolutely. Because, you know, there's there's just so much to... uh, Everyone's going, well, it's because of this that it's going to be this way. It's like, yeah, but we don't... We now have this information and you can't discount that anymore. And all these fights about what is or isn't valuable and how we can use it and, yeah, all the things that it's going to disprove down the road as well, which is going to change so many other things down the road. And so much of it, you know, I think scientists, we tend to shy away from the discussion, but I think it's also important to, for us to be honest about how big pharmaceuticals also do <laughs> not want this to happen, right? And we yeah. we talk a lot about oh, well, you know, like we innovate in things, but there's also this strange underpinning of, well, it's also difficult to innovate in some ways because if you cure disease, right, you're just sort of <laughs> knocking an entire industry out. Um, yeah. And so things do have a strange tendency of getting sort of delayed and, you know, like yeah. special special projects getting second looks and second glances that they shouldn't. And Absolutely. strange, very strange, yeah. but interesting, <laughs> I mean- fascinating field and so critical. It is. And you, you see those kinds of conflicts as well in, you know, energy. You know, it, it's oh all those kinds of things yeah. where things get slowed down because businesses want to keep running. It's like, that's fair. But, you know, as we could see over the last three years, people can figure out how to pivot. You'll work it out. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, as, as I'm watching, to- totally relevant. Uh, I told you before we started recording, I went hiking today. Yeah. And there were all of these mushrooms. And I love mycology. I love seeing all the mushrooms out. But it's December and there's it's dry, supposedly, during this time of year. But there's so many mushrooms. And if you look through all of the texts and databases, it'll say, you know, this mushroom is quite rare to find this time of year. And, <laughs> you know, you're seeing all of these funguses that should be in warm, moist weather in December where they shouldn't be. And I was talking to my significant other and he was like, I love the mushrooms. I was like, yeah, but this is a really bad indication that global warming is is happening. <laughs> like it is, this is a warm, moist environment where it shouldn't be. And uh, so, so yeah, so the energy debate, rough. <laughs> it's a rough topic <laughs> right now. <laughs> it is. Oh, but yeah, it, it's making everyone think about, you know, priorities and, you know, how we should, yeah, how we should drive commercial venture because, a lot of the research these days needs to have funding and grants, and a lot of those come from commerce and industry because that's where the money is. And exactly. Yeah. It, 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 it's a tough kind of space to be in because, on one hand, you know, as scientists, you're going into it because you're curious. You want to solve problems. You want to figure stuff out. But at the same time, you need money to do that. And yes, it's, it's expensive. It's a, yeah, it's an expensive thing to have to invest your time in. And it's... Yeah, it's a system that we need to kind of review. <laughs> and yes. It's, yeah, it, it's, there's so many layers to this. It's going to take more than the time we have. But, you yeah, know, at the crux of it, we just want to solve problems. We just want to, you know, make things better for everybody in some way. Yeah, it might make a few businesses a little bit redundant, but, you know, we can innovate. We're human. We can evolve. It's it's not a We're- static position. <laughs> Listen, we are in the position we are because we evolved, right? We were very weak, yep. little hairless creatures at one point, And we were like, you know what? We're clever. We can make this work. <laughs> okay. 
I think we can still do it. <laughs> yeah, we're creative little balls of meat and blood. It's fine. <laughs> exactly. We're super vulnerable in the wild, but we'll develop <laughs> clothes and we'll make fire and it'll be fine. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's totally okay. We've done this before. <laughs> Another one of the big things that you are totally passionate about, which I love, is science communication. And yes. you know, you've got this very cool series called 60 Seconds of Science. So what motivated that? You know, it began as me just doing experiments for the entertainment of my friends live on <laughs> camera. And they became a bit more explosive as I garnered more supporters and, you know, more requests. And uh, I I had a friend group that said, you should really take this to the public. You know, people would love this. I show my kids what you're doing. And and so I just began explaining things in, in 60 seconds on Instagram because in the past that was all that Instagram allowed. 60 seconds yeah. and you're good for a video. So I'm really – everyone's like, 60 seconds of science, that's brilliant. I'm like, no, I was just lazy. <laughs> I just didn't <laughs> want to edit. So I just did 60 seconds straight. And, um, you know, I, I started garnering a following, and then they began requesting things. And, and I never – I don't think I began this journey saying, you know, I'm going to do public outreach and I'm going to educate the public and I'm uh, become an activist in that sense. But it's something that I realized is so necessary. Mm. And there's such a massive divide and um, sort of a, a hole in science literacy that exists in the public. And because of that, you see that misinformation and pseudoscience can get spread so quickly. And mm -hmm. so while you have all of the influencers and people on their soapbox trying to sell things and shill pseudoscience to the public and it, you know, garners these viral videos and people go wild, uh, I try to counter that as much as possible with my own just objective, fun, scientific information. Um, so it's I, – I definitely think there should be more of us because you're starting <laughs> to see – flat earth garnering steam and i'm like how yeah. are we getting back we're, we're going back hundreds of years here folks um so you know I, I think there's a way especially now with covid especially in the united states there was such a a turn a back turning with the public to, towards its scientists right and mm -hmm. you look at something like the 60s and the space race and the nation was gripped by science and space and astronauts and what was possible for our species. Yeah. And now there is, and I know you feel it, there is definitely a, a divisive environment between the public and, and us. And it's not going to work. We can't, we cannot do big things. We cannot come together and solve big problems divided. Um, mm -hmm. We need the public. We need their support. And so I find that just kind of re-inspiring that awe and that curiosity that drives us, that has drived yeah. us since we were small, um, it's easy to inspire in the public. You just have to, you just have to pick the right topics. COVID and, and the CDC talking to us, not so much. But, um, you know, <laughs> interesting things I find that the public is just in awe of still. So it's yeah. trying to extract that out as you can in bits and pieces. Exactly. And yeah, you know, it, it is about trying to reignite that curiosity and that interest and that love of what can happen what is possible and you know all the stuff that's going on at the moment you know especially with ai there's so much fear as well it's like well you think about a lot of the science that we've had is kind of developed by the military and defense so you know they, there were motivations exactly. for that but no creation like magic isn't just from evil like magic is how you wield it right so exactly. it, it's trying to teach people it's like, yeah, you could go kind of the villain route. That that's totally a thing that people do, and that's a valid concern. But there's all this other cool stuff that you could do over here, and it's just trying to remind people that if you kind of push people down the good route and the fun route and the exciting route, then you know you don't really need to worry so much about the villain route as long as you're aware about it. <laughs> of course, ap aptly put, and it's interesting, you know the. That fear grows rather quickly. You know, it, it starts with, well, the government's trying to make us get vaccines we don't want. And then it turns into they're trying to microchip us and listen to my <laughs> terrible conversations with my mother-in-law on a Friday. You know? <laughs> and um, and it, it just sort of it spirals out of control. But I, I think that's such a great point to remind them that, you know, something like quantum computing Sure, you could use it to develop a laser to blast people from space. Sure, you could. 
But you could also use it to cure cancer. You can also <laughs> use it to figure out how to develop more advanced rocketry to get us to another planet and to explore other planets. And so I think by and large, people are good, right? And there's a few that are bad, but I think the good ones outnumber the bad ones, yeah. certainly. I like to hope anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just trying to remind people that all this potential is not negative. Like there's so many other things that we could do with it that's exciting that also has value to them. Like if you want to really kind of get into the whole let's, let's make it matter to them. Like, yeah, this is how it can apply to your life. This is how it can improve your quality of life, how it can improve your living conditions, how it can improve your workspace. Like there's so many things that you can do with all the things that we have, that we have potential to create that can benefit you in of course. so many, so much capacity. And science is so fluid, right? It, like we were talking about earlier, there's so much, so much cross-pollination between specialties. And I love teaching people that, hey, did you know that astrophysicists and astronomers are the reason that we have MRIs. Did yes. you know that NASA is the reason that you have a cell phone, you know, and it's all of these very far that you would think so, what is the furthest thing from human medicine? Somebody, you know, analyzing frequencies of star light, you know, but yeah. these are the people that that have helped develop modern medical technologies today. Um, yeah. So when people are like, oh, NASA doesn't need a budget, I'm like, actually, actually, <laughs> yes, it does. Do. <laughs> this affects you directly. <laughs> yeah. This affects you directly. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, there's so many times where I've had conversations with past guests where it's like, yeah, like the scope of what you're doing is so much bigger than what you're actually doing. And it's just because, yes. like, you know, geographer working with NASA, and it's like, yeah, but that's it's all about space. Yeah, but they got satellites we can look on Earth. Like, we can look down and see what's going on on this planet. This is important. This is why we need NASA, because they got the infrastructure up there that we can use. Exactly. <laughs> Critically important. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we've got things like, you know, intelligent services use amazing AI and visual and imaging stuff to be able to track who people are. It's like, super scary. CCTV, not awesome. However... If you can apply the sort of same sort of science as to, to you know, uh, one of the big ones is gait detect, uh, gait analysis, the way that mm -hmm. you walk. It's like, yeah, you know what else you can do with gait analysis? Determine if someone has a condition that they need to look into very, very quickly because it's degenerative. Like, of course, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, it's yeah, it's it's that it's that thing again. And I don't know, I think. Conspiracy theory is fun to think about, right? <laughs> it's the it gets people riled up, you know, but when you talk about, yeah, well, you know, go into this biomechanics lab and they'll put sensors on you and they'll watch you walk. I mean, that's not as cool as, as saying like, oh, they're designing these algorithms <laughs> to so that they can identify you based on your walk and then take you out into a van and put a hood over your head. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's it's more evocative and, and more entertaining to listen to, to conspiracy theories than yeah. sometimes the science can be a, a little bit boring, right? The lead yeah. up to the big the big things. Absolutely. I mean, this is why thriller f films sell, right? <laughs> oh, of course. Of course. I mean, I love, you know, as, as a scientist, I will say this. I love Ancient Aliens, that show. Yep. It is right. I mean, I laugh and I love joking about how terrible the science is, but it's hilarious to, to mm -hmm. see these conspiracy, these ancient alien theorists on there. Yep. And um, the guy that's lauded for his, you know, his scientific interpretation. And I was like, I looked him up and he went to junior college and got like a sports publishing <laughs> degree. <laughs> I was like, yes, no scientific background whatsoever. <laughs> and it's phenomenal. So I get it. I totally get it. I would be I would be remiss if I said that I didn't understand the appeal. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, there's so much stuff out there that we watch. It's completely inaccurate. But, you know, we do it because oh, yeah. it's fun and it makes you think. And, you know, that's why science fiction exists, because it makes you explore and be curious. And some of it's really wacky, but some of it turns out into Star Trek that kind of feeds back into reality. So, you know, it, it, it all comes around. <laughs> I mean, think about the Jetsons when they had TVs yeah. that you could talk to people through. I mean, what a crazy idea. And now I just did it today with my dad. <laughs> it's crazy. It's exactly. so crazy. Yeah. Oh, life follows art. Absolutely. And they were saying that, you know, Star Trek is the reason why we've got flip phones. <laughs> it's like, and yeah. you know, all this kind of stuff, like it, it's, it's all kind of feeding back because human imagination can actually make stuff happen for good. <laughs> exactly. You know, science, some scientists saying, well, yeah, but like, what if we could do that? You know, <laughs> it all starts yeah. with, uh, what if we try to do that? That would be cool. <laughs> Absolutely. 
yeah. So, you know, what if, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, you, you know, what if I wrote a book? <laughs> so why, why, why did you write a book about, you know, the no stupid questions in science when you already have this amazing platform with 60 seconds? Like, was there a reason for the switch in medium or you just weren't getting out the content you wanted? You know, I, I honestly, I was just driving in the car one day and I thought I was thinking about, you know, a, a random question that I got. And I can't remember what it was. It, this is how random it was. It was probably something like, why is the sky blue? And I was like, man, somebody should write a book where they just kind of write these wry, funny, <laughs> quick answers to just this compendium of questions. And then immediately thought, I should write that book. I do that anyway. <laughs> yeah, you do it anyway. And, um, I do it anyway. And so, you know, it was, it's been such a wild ride because this is my debut book, but I found through the process that I've loved it. And so I mm. now have like nine other ideas for scientific books. You've got a bug. And uh, <laughs> exactly. I'm like, oh man, now, now this is a thing. Great. <laughs> um, but it was such a blast. And I, I see it as just sort of an extension of that desperate attempt to reach the public on a core level, right? Mm -hmm. To, you know, because it's a compendium of all all the questions that I've been asked that I haven't answered online that are so strange. You know, like, is it possible to clone a woolly mammoth? And, uh, you know, why do men have nipples? And what's the purpose of pubic hair? Or can you get sick from not having sex? And just the most random questions. And um, it was such a blast to research and to write and give people real answers to. And, um, you know, I I just see it as, a, as an extension of trying to, you know, some people are, they listen and that's how they learn. Some people are readers. So if I can reach the maximum amount of people possible and I can change one person's mind who is dubious yep. about science, then it was worth writing the entire book. That's awesome. And why crayon? Because you, you illustrated your things in crayon. <laughs> and I love that. Right. That's amazing. That was the most <laughs> difficult part of the entire book. It's like 108 questions that I had to rigorously. I mean, people were asking, uh, you know, questions about string theory. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm in upstream medical <laughs> research. Now I've got to answer about string theory here. So it took it took some of it took quite a while to research. But um, I was I wanted to hearken back to that sort of childlike nature of the questions, right? Because it's a book for adults. There's some profanity in it, full disclosure. <laughs> um, but I wanted to do crayon drawings because how often do you look at a textbook and they're technical drawings? And I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make little silly caricatures of viruses and I'm going to sh you know, show all these principles drawn in crayon. And that was the, I don't know why I did. That was the most difficult medium to work with, I think, was crayon. <laughs> Absolutely. But it was, it was a blast. It was a blast. That is very, very cool. So I've been speaking to a lot of people in science who are getting into writing books. And I just love the process of the way that they go through it. And everyone has this unique way of going about it. But, you know, what is the best or what was the best and worst part about writing your book? I would say the the best part was, was the discovery of it, you know, because as I said, I am in upstream medical research. So a lot of it I know I, I love and I just enjoy and I eat up all kinds of science, right? I have quantum physicists in my bookshelf and evolutionary biologists. I love reading about everyone's work. I'm always fascinated about what people are researching. So I kind of, I dabble in everything. And so sort of uh, the best part was challenging myself. And I always tell people, if you can't explain your research to somebody on a sixth grade reading level, then you don't know your research well enough. Yeah. So for me, the best part was the challenge of having to break down something like, is teleportation possible? Or why can't we travel faster than the speed of light? I mean, that evokes time dilation and yeah. space time continuity. And, and so being able to do that in a page was so fun because I had to really get into the nuts and bolts. And, and I loved that part. Um, the most difficult part, I think, because I am a, I am a procrastinator, if there ever was one, was just having a hard deadline <laughs> because I was like, <laughs> I got time, you know, I got time because I, I, I'm a nine to five scientist anyway, yeah. and I'm still doing science communication on the internet. And I was like, ah, I got like six months. And then I'm like, I got four months. And then I found myself <laughs> towards the end, staying up at night, just frantic with cups of, you know, spilt coffee all over the desk, <laughs> just getting through it. Um, but it, it was a blast and I, I have been blown away by the response. You know, it, it has been a Barnes and Noble bestseller as a pre-order book. Yeah. Um, and, and people just saying, I cannot wait to read it. And I never, 
in my wild, I was like, I'm, I'm probably going to sell like 50 books, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I never would have thought that it would rally people and people that I have that have never come in contact with me have since found me and said, I cannot wait to read this. I'm so excited. I can't wait till June. Will you sign my book? And I'm like, this is what I wanted. I wanted people to be so happy about science for the first yeah. time in a couple of years, right? Science has been so oppressive and scary and it's been bastardized and twisted and weaponized on on uh, contem- traditional media, um, you know, and, and I wanted to break that down. I wanted to give some people a chance to see the beauty of it and a non-scary side. And so I've just been over the moon about that. That's been the apps, probably the best part. Oh, that's amazing. Like, and, and yeah, because you never expect that. You, you never know what the response is going to be to something you create. And it must be just so gratifying. <laughs> it's awesome. And I, I just, you know, I, I, we, we are sending a bunch of sort of advanced copies to the printer now for reviewers to read, right? It's sending them to all like the major folks mm-hmm. that review books. And um, I'm excited to see what they say, you know, because it's yeah. so vulnerable because you're putting that weird <laughs> voice in your head <laughs> on the paper for other people to know what your weird voice on the inside sounds like, right? <laughs> and so it's exciting. It's a little nerve-wracking, but it is exciting. And I, I hope that the the reviewers like it and uh, that they also enjoy the science as well. So, Absolutely. And yeah, it, it's, it's such a great way of doing outreach because, you know, a lot of people don't do the video, don't do the social media stuff. Exactly. And a lot of the people you want to reach are the ones who aren't in those spaces and they're not actively going to seek it out so being able to give it to them in another medium that they can just pick up and put down and read in chunks and you know flip to an open page that's random and just go oh that's kind of neat you know that that's exactly how you want to, be able to reach them exactly and so many of my predecessors you know they they have a very top-down strategy where they're like i am an expert in x and i'm going to lecture y to you you know and you kind of get stuck in their narrative like i i'm reading brian green right now and Mm -hmm. he does theoretical physics and talks a lot about parallel universes and it's gripping but so much of it he deviates into these rabbit holes of just the (laughs) mathematics and i'm like oh my gosh you know this is really dense um but the beauty I think about there are no stupid questions in science is that it allows the reader to choose what they wanted to hear. These are all yeah. questions from from my fan base. Um, yeah. And so that's been great. And and understanding and re reinforming yourself as a scientist that some of the most simple childlike questions evoke the absolutely most elegant responses. Absolutely. It's, it's incredible. You know, like, why is the sky blue? Rayleigh scattering is such a cool thing to describe. You know, that's such an easy <laughs> question with with something you could write an entire book on in and of itself. Exactly. So because they're all, you know, community questions, surely there has to be heaps more. How did you decide which ones to, you know, keep and which ones to drop? It was tough. Oh, the ones that I kept were just ones that I didn't answer. I, you know, I, for whatever reason on a given day, I was like, ah, I, I want to answer this or this one or, you know, what have you. Although I do allow my my audience to direct the questions, I get so many and then I sort of yeah. allow them to pick out of a few. Um, and, you know, but part of a, another part of reading or writing the book rather was reading through that list of questions and saying like, these are all so valuable, but I just don't have the capacity to sit down and record videos for all of these. <laughs> so why don't I just do one large project that encapsulates them all? Um, yeah. so I do have a uh, full disclosure, another probably 108 for a second volume of this, should, wow. it, be, <laughs> should it be necessary, <laughs> that are just waiting of just random, very random questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's kind of like with you know, XKCD, right? Like all the what ifs that he yes. does. Because some of those are really wild. And it's like, they're, they're not simple questions either, some of the ones that he addresses. But there's of still course. kind of things and like, they're, they're like late night Google, right? It's like, it's late, I'm bored, I'm thinking, it's like, huh, random question, let's yeah. Google this. <laughs> and listen, all all props to Randall Monroe for writing the What If series, because yeah. mine mine is different because the questions are basically answering what is, you know, people yeah. asking me questions about physical phenomenon. He had to go down another rabbit hole because yeah. those are all theoreticals. Those Absolutely. are all, you, you know, <laughs> where he had to say, okay, I not only need to explain the science, but then I need to explain the implications of what you're asking. Um, so I ha- he's one of my my comp authors. And um, I told my publisher, if 
if Randall <laughs> wants to do some kind of collaboration someday, let him know that I am by all means open because I've been Absolutely. a fan of his comics for years. I mean, who among the scientific community doesn't know his comic <laughs> series, you know? <laughs> exactly. He touches all of us. <laughs> he does. He really does. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so we can start to round off with those questions that are, yeah, indirect. I used to call them soft questions. I've stopped because people told me they're not very soft. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> what field of or hobby, sorry, what hobby or interest do you have that is most unrelated to your field of work? So I am a power lifter. And I would Ooh. say that that's probably incredibly dichotomous because I am a huge geek. I mean, like, make, make no mistake, massive geek. But uh, I do power lift. I mean, every week. I haven't competed in a while, uh, nor am I planning to anytime in the foreseeable future. But, you know, uh, getting out there and deadlifting 225 pounds is a bit different than <laughs> yeah. being a geek behind a screen or doing statistics in my day-to-day -day job. Yeah. And it, it because of the nature of the exercise, like... You must be very rigid about your diet. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I always joke. I power lift, not because I like lifting, because I like eating. <laughs> so <laughs> I, use it, I use it to combat my caloric intake. <laughs> well, I mean, if it works, right? <laughs> it works, I'm telling you. Um, but, you know, I, I find that uh, at least the way that I've developed – it's really difficult for me to sit down and work on a problem consecutively. I'm a very sprint worker. And I, mm -hmm. I always tell people, you know, work in a capacity that is helpful to you. Because if you have a hypothesis or something you're trying to test or, a, you know, even just a, a lab protocol you're trying to write. Uh, and it, if you work great in a marathon and you can do a nine to five consistently, great. I do like a two hour mad dash frantic work and I'll get so much done. And then I got to take like three hours and take a break. And then I come back to it and do another couple of hours. So the lifting, I think, helps me step away from that, especially if I'm like really deep in some kind of nasty analysis and yeah. data mining. Um, you got to step away and it helps, I think, keep you fresh and sharp. So yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, your brain's always going to be working in the background, but you just need to stop focusing on it directly for a little while. Of course, of course. I can't. I would not be able. I would melt into my seat. <laughs> I have to just step away every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And which childhood book holds the strongest memories for you? I've got two. Um, one is I Wonder If Dragons Are Real. And that was just mm. a book about reptiles. And I love reptiles. And I found the other day on the sidewalk. I didn't even know that this existed. It's called, uh, I believe, A Bellamy Blind Snake. And I thought it was a little worm. It was like three inches long and it was uh, shiny and black and it was nighttime. And I looked at it and I was like, oh, that worm slithers an awful lot like a snake. And I picked <laughs> it up and it was this little blind snake. He had like a, a snubbed nose yeah. and it looked – it was like completely symmetrically cylindrical all the way to its tail. It didn't even have like a little tapered tail. It was just like a blunted tail. And I was like, "There's what is this? There's no way this is real. It was this alien that I found, and I looked it up, and it's a it's a little bl black blind snake. I love reptiles, amazing. And it turns out they eat like ant larvae, and they live underground. And for whatever reason, he had popped out from underground and on the sidewalk, and I found him. <laughs> um, so that was one of my favorites. And then the other one, like if we're talking like young child, was uh, it's raining meatballs. Nice. I don't know if you remember that book. Oh, the illustrations in that book. I sat and looked at that thing for hours, for yep. hours. The best. Absolutely. What about you? What's your favorite childhood book? Does anyone ask you? Sometimes. And it varies from time to time. So it depends on which one I'm kind of like engaged with at the time. And one of my favorites is called Cat Witch by Una Woodruff. And cat it's about, witch. yeah, it's about this witch. And, you know, she has a familiar and the familiar is a cat. And the cat's trying to figure stuff out and goes on an adventure. But what I really loved about it were the illustrations. Because it was just so whimsical and so beautiful and so detailed. And there's, like, every time you look at it, there's something new to see. And I just would kind of think, like, yeah, the story is great, but these pictures are so pretty. So, so let me yeah, ask you this. Do you still have it? Yes. Oh, uh -huh. I found it in the library. It, you know, I finished school, went away, didn't have access to it, went, I really like that book. I'm going to go find it. So I found it on eBay, bought it, and now it's sitting on my shelf. <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's just one of the, yeah, I, I just loved it. It has no true educational value, but it was beautiful and I loved it for that. <laughs> that's that's the best. I love that both you and I were drawn to the pictures, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, got, you got 
those gripping pictures where, yeah, you look at it and there's something new every time you see it. Absolutely. Yeah, this is the best ones. <laughs> the best. <laughs> yeah. And you know, in your conversation and chocolate croissants, you also have Where's Waldo? <laughs> oh, yeah. I've got a Where's Waldo. You know what? Um, and since you listen to chocolate croissants, you know that there were things that I swore were not able to be found. I still yep. haven't found them. And it's been a couple of years. I think. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> I promise you, they they are sending they they're sending so us on. Uh, it is on this completely non doable quest. It's terrible. <laughs> I swear it's not there. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that though because so many people are going. No, I swear I'm gonna be able to do it. And they just stare at it for ages, going, "It's gonna happen one day." <laughs> I, I haven't done it. I and I pr I promise you, it's been two years. I think, or a little bit more, since that podcast was was recorded, and I still it's not there. I promise. I promise. <laughs> I should write the publisher and be like, "You show me where these False are." Because I <laughs> exactly because I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can you imagine a response if it actually wasn't in there? It's like, ha, huh, we're waiting for someone to say that. <laughs> I know, and I was the one. I was the one that found it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And lastly, what advice would you give someone who would like to do what you do or what advice should they ignore? I would say be unapologetically you. Be true to yourself and your nature that will help you creatively as a scientist. I think that it's taken for granted the amount of creativity that's necessary to be a successful scientist, right? Um, and there are a lot of people that will tell you certain things like, don't have visible tattoos. Hey, I have an entire <laughs> sleeve of tattoos. Don't have piercings. I have a nose piercing. Um, you know, these are superficial things that don't yeah. matter. If you are doing something that you're passionate about, it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter where you come from. And that's what's so important about women in STEM fields, right? Mm. Sometimes if you don't see women in a position of authority in the sciences, you just never conceptualize that it's possible. Um, so just be you. Go in there, even if you are a marginalized group because of your gender or your ethnicity, where you're from, your background, it doesn't matter. Go in there, be brazen, have a thunderous sense of self, explore, be excited, and honestly, never, ever, ever lose your sense of curiosity. Don't let the day-to-day -day doldrums of being in a lab or doing data analysis beat down that curiosity. Um, always, always keep that, that childlike awe. And I think you will find that science will be a lot more fun. And a lot of the hypotheses and things will come a lot more readily when you're trying to unpack a big problem. Absolutely. And yeah, so much about the like, image kind of thing as well, because, you know, I've spoken to scientists with colored hair, who've got an unconventional hairstyles, who've got tattoos, who, you know, they, they've got piercings or, you know, they do things that people think aren't conventionally feminine. And it's like, that's got no bearing on your passion and your interest and your capabilities. And you know, it, it's what does it not have to do with science? That. Exactly. Yeah. This is not relevant. Nothing. And, you know, spoken to a surgeon who was told she was too short. It's like, like that, that's got no bearing on my ability to be a good surgeon. It doesn't have any yeah. bearing on my skills. <laughs> And, there yeah. was a, a colleague of mine who applied for medical school and she had her hair down during the interview. And one of the interviewers told his colleagues, I'm not going to accept her because her hair was down. It's going it's going to get caught in the cadaver. And we're like, you can tie it you're, up. Just, <laughs> you're just looking for reasons, yeah. you know. And I think uh, when I went in, I definitely went in and I, I tried to be so straight laced. And if I had, you know, I had a little a couple of little tiny tattoos here and there and I would cover them up and, you know, I would put makeup on them and wear long sleeves and like I would try to look so polished. And that wasn't me. You know what I mean? And yeah. I think that I began to shine in my career when I just embraced who I was. I was loud. I was raucous. I was kind of the class clown. But I found that my higher ups, my mentors that have championed me, they have always said that that was, even though <laughs> very surprising for them when I came in and was such an oddball, that was the best thing about about who I was, is that I was genuine to myself. And so I, I think just being who you are is so important in this field. Absolutely. Yeah. And you, you need to have conviction about your identity and who you are in order to be able to know that you have conviction about your science and what you're doing. Absolutely. It's aptly put. I aptly put. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, if people want to find out more about your work and what you're doing, where can they go? 
I think the easiest place is just to go to my website. You can find my social media links on there, links to the book, links to my research publications. And that is super easy for you guys. Just leahelson.com. Amazing. Yeah. And this has been such an incredible conversation, Leah. I, I have loved hearing about your trajectory and, you know, how you came to these different aspects of your life and how you approach it with such passion and conviction is is just really amazing just to speak to someone who just knows what they want to do and knows where they're going to go. <laughs> it's been delightful. Thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. Yeah, and yeah, it, it's it's such a blast. And every conversation I have, I'm always so passionate about whatever it is they're doing and wanting to know <laughs> more about what they're doing next because, yeah, it all of you do such amazing work. <laughs> You're like me. Every time I read somebody's book or see what they're doing, I'm like, oh, I wish I had done that. You know what I mean? I wish I had done that part of science. I wish I had done astronomy. I wish I had done this. Yeah. I, get to I love hearing curiously. about everybody else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Through all of my awesome colleagues. <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Well, yeah, thank you again so much. This has been absolutely wonderful. And, you know, good luck on the remaining, how many months? Six, seven months of your book tour pre-launch. Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. So, yeah. Thank you again, and I hope you have an amazing evening. Oh, yes, amazing evening. <laughs> <laughs> you as well. <laughs> if you enjoyed this conversation, please let me know. Subscribe to the show, leave us a rating, and share this with your geeky or geek curious friends. You can also support Steam Powered on Patreon and the Steam Powered Show, the link for which will also be in the show notes. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>